Okay, so let's uh, start the discussion. It's a similar type of discussion because I think this is the best way, you know, uh, to to teach you guys at this moment. Uh, I have uh, compiled some of the interesting and important cases. Okay, as far as possible. So let's do this. Okay, so all of you, uh, please uh, look at this slide. Yesterday. I prepared in the old format, so that was a little bit, you know, not that good actually for you. So today I prepared some slides for you. So please go through it. And when you are ready, just let me know. Okay, so anybody who is, who is ready to answer here? It's a little bit difficult probably. This is uh, about the prognosis of malignancies. So this type of you know discussion, maybe we have not done before. So it is an important uh, concept for you. Okay, that's why I've included this here. Now- The most can see. Yes, yes, Elias. So most probably you can see this patient is having jaundice and having mass at the head of pancreas, while the uh, histological report also indicate like necrol cytoplasmic dissociation, which indicates the uh, tumor of the head of pancreas, which has very poor prognosis, while the adenocarcinoma of the esophagus also is having poor prognosis. Very good. Okay. I completely agree with you. This is the answer here. Now, uh, let, let me utilize this, this chance to explain, okay? Please listen carefully. This type of question also commonly asked these days. This patient, okay, a 55 year old, a 55 year old male presents to the hospital with jaundice and ultrasonography demonstrate a five centimeter mass in the head of the pancreas. So without any doubt, this is a tumor in the head of the pancreas, most probably carcinoma of the head of the pancreas. And it has given pressure to the common bile duct. That's why it has got jaundice. ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, ERCP was done and they have taken some cells from there, which demonstrated it is a malignancy. This is a malignancy. This is the hallmark of malignancy. Here, hyperchromatic nuclei and a high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. This is the histopathology of malignancy. Now, a few small glands composed of these cells are also seen in the cytologic preparation. These are the tumor cells. Now, the question is not the diagnosis, okay? The question is, the overall prognosis for this man will be more similar to 
that of a patient with which of the following malignancy this is carcinoma of the head of the pancreas and it has worst prognosis probably the worst among all type of malignancies okay but very near to that is carcinoma of the esophagus is absolutely right so let's take the opportunity okay to go through this another slide okay i want to go through this for you okay now share here this patient has pancreatic adenocarcinoma which we have correctly picked and it has one of the worst prognosis with 3.5% overall five year survival rate which is one of the worst there is no doubt about it here the adenocarcinoma of the esophagus is also not that far behind the 10% survival rate five year survival rate is only 10% it is better in comparison to 3.5 but it is very close now all other adenocarcinoma of the breast adenocarcinoma of the colon adenocarcinoma of the prostate and gastric lymphoma all of them have more than 50% five year survival rate okay some even reach 75 to 85% so don't forget if this type of question is asked okay you can handle it properly now Okay, can you go through the second one now? Okay, this is a very uh, important case okay just go through those uh, uh, clinical picture and try to reach to the diagnosis Okay, anyone? To breast cirrhosis. Okay. Who is answering that? Can you can you repeat again? Uh, it's Michael. Uh, to breast sclerosis. Okay, Michael, can you explain why to breast sclerosis? Uh, most of the features such as mental irritation and type of being pigmented. Uh, uh, skin patches in that condition. Okay, good. Can you tell me what is the name of that skin patches? 
those hypopigmented patches on the trunk, what are they called? Uh, I'm not really sure about that. Okay, your diagnosis is correct though, okay? Is absolutely correct. This is a case of tuberous sclerosis. So uh, let me explain this from the very beginning. Just follow this. This is a 10-year-old boy okay, who presented with a history of epilepsy. This is how tuberous sclerosis usually present. It is a growth inside the central nervous system which can lead to intractable epilepsy. This epilepsy is very difficult to control even with medication. And Another type of presentation is mental retardation. Now for that, uh, the, the case was brought for evaluation. During physical examination, the doctor found out there were several ovoid hypopigmented areas on the trunk, okay? Now these are called ash leaf spot. Ash leaf spot, there's a typical name in uh, tuberous sclerosis. Another very typical finding is also given. There are large number of red and yellow papules on the face, okay? These are called adenoma sebaceum because the biopsy demonstrate angiofibromata, okay? They are called adenoma sebaceum. Now, I don't need any more clues than this. This is a tuberous sclerosis. But there are so many other important, uh, you know, uh, options there okay so let me utilize to explain the answer slide for you okay now see here let me go to the another one see here okay the correct answer is d this disease is tuberous sclerosis there's no doubt about it okay let me erase this first and then do it again okay here. Now, the facial angiofibromata are called adenoma sebaceum. Please remember this. It almost looks like a, a acne actually, or it almost looks like a growth from the sebaceous gland, but actually these are misnomer, okay? They are angiofibromata. They are not growth from sebaceous gland. And the hypopigmented patch on the trunk are called ash leaf spot. So if these two you have identified, then this has to be tuberous sclerosis. Now, if I go into the detail, this tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, okay, and sturz weber syndrome, these all are known as phacomatosis. The meaning is they have certain finding on the skin and all of them affect central nervous system as well. Now, reg regarding tuberous sclerosis, it is autosomal dominant disorder. Epilepsy and mental retardation are very common finding, okay? Now, let's go quickly to other part. Acoustic neuroma is a feature of neurofibromatosis type two. Now, there are two types of neurofibromatosis, type one and type two. Type one is very extensive disorder, which is also known as von reckling gaussen disease. And Neurofibromatosis type two is associated with acoustic neuroma. So I've taken this class in ENT, if you remember. Another one, the capillary hemangioblastoma is a feature of von hippel lindau syndrome. Now in this condition, multiple hemangioma are found in different places of the body. If you remember, this is, okay, one of the risk factor for renal cell carcinoma as well, von hippel lindau syndrome. Another case is also very interesting, this term, arnold Chiari malformation. In this arnold Chiari malformation, the cerebellar tonsil, they herniate from cere uh, foramen magnum towards uh, the spinal cord. There are two types of arnold Chiari malformation, type one and type two. Now, one special point I like to highlight here, in type two, it is usually associated with spina bifida, only in type two. In type one, there is only herniation of cerebellar tonsil, but in type two, Arnold Carey malformation, along with that, uh, there is spina bifida as well. And the last one, 
is sturz weber syndrome or disease it has a very typical finding on the face anybody can tell me what finding you get on the face in case of sturz weber syndrome maybe you have you know studied this somewhere port weinstein very nice this is called port weinstein absolutely this port weinstein is so typical it looks you know a bit pinkish to reddish uh, stain on the face and the same uh, child this is usually diagnosed in the child can have epilepsy as well okay so this is a very you know good discussion uh, for you so let me check whether some students want to join yes teddy wants to join okay now let's let's go to number 3 Remember one point. Uh, try to list some of the important, uh, you know, uh, points in your notebook. Okay, and do it properly. Just simply looking there is not going to help you. Yes, anyone? Yes. Sir, I think I will go with tuberculosis, option E. Can you give me reason? Sir, uh, first of all, hilar lymph adenitis are seen in um, tuberculous adenitis, sir. Uh -huh. And uh, the acid fast 10 also is, is for tuberculosis, TB, sir. Okay. But acid fast stain is negative here, isn't it? You can see there, it's negative. Yes. See this? Yes. Acid fast, a silver, and PAS yes. stain, all are negative. Anybody yes. else? Anybody else? It's okay. Option D. Uh, sir, I, I sarcoidosis. Okay, I'll give chance uh, one by one, okay? Yes. Yes, please. Sarcoidosis. Thika. Thika and Kedar are speaking. Yes. Okay, Thika, what is your answer? Uh, sarcoidosis. Can you give reason? Can you give explanation from that? Because she's an African American woman and they are predisposed to um, sarcoidosis. Okay, that's one good clue. Yes. Any other? Okay, Kedar. Uh, the age, it occurs mostly in middle aged individuals. Uh, sir, there is a sedating granuloma there, and the uh, acid past is uh, negative, which okay. means that it can be tuberculosis. Sarcoidosis also present with the granulomatis on the lung, and there uh -huh. is hyalur lymphadenopathy. Hyalur lymphadenopathy. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so uh, they both of them are absolutely right. This is sarcoidosis. So let me explain again for all the other students, okay? Now see here, this, this African-American 
uh, race. She's absolutely right. Is is very you know, uh, for example, risk, you know, race for sarcoidosis development. But many other important clues are given apart from that. Another is hilar lymphadenopathy, very common in sarcoidosis. There occurs bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Another one, even the long parenchyma is diffusely affected. And the biopsy was done from those lymph nodes and they revealed, okay, there is granuloma, but those granuloma do not have any caseation. So it rules out tuberculosis. Tuberculosis cannot be there now. Even acid fast stain is negative. So TB cannot be there. Okay. Any other atypical mycobacteria cannot be there. The silver and PAS stain are done mainly for fungal lesions. Now see there, some of the options are fungi, coccidioidy mycosis and histoplasmosis. These are the fungal diseases. So to rule out, uh, they have given this clue. Okay, these stains are negative. So uh, uh, this case is sarcoidosis. Leprosy never present like this. Okay, now let me quickly go through it because this is a uh, information for you. Sarcoidosis is a common granulomatous disease, the etiology of which remains unclear. That's why we call it idiopathic granulomatous inflammation. It is a diagnosis of exclusion and mycobacterial, fungal are used to rule out infectious etiology. Now see that this acid fast and silver stain as well as PS stains are negative here. So those infectious etiology cannot be considered. And they clearly showed granuloma, which is seen in sarcoidosis. Let's move on to the number four. Option B, sir. Sorry, option B. Yes, sir. Okay, wait. Uh, option B. Okay, you are absolutely correct. Okay, this is an easy one actually. Uh, why, Elias? Um, right? Why, Elias? It's option B. Sir, there is atopic asthma, which is aller mainly allergic in nature, while is absolutely increase like. Yeah. yeah, you are absolutely correct, okay? So this is a very easy clue for you. This is a case of atopic asthma. Uh, this is allergic disease. And in any type of allergic disease, eosinophilic leukocytosis is seen in the peripheral blood. But I, this is very easy, okay? We, we don't give this type of easy things for you. But I am, uh, you know, keeping this type of clinical picture to teach you a little bit more things, though you most of the students know this already. Okay, see here. What are the common causes of eosinophilia? Now, see here. Okay, those immune mediated disease, okay, also known as allergic conditions like bronchial asthma, hay fever, hay fever is also known as allergic rhinitis, and even pemphigus vulgaris. Okay, and many other parasitic infestation all of them are associated with eosinophilia so in in uh, you know other type of clinical picture we can simply give this option and it still asks the same question now, basophilic leukocytosis is a very rare event and it is mainly seen in myelogenous leukemia that is chronic myelogenous leukemia cml Lymphocytosis, many students can answer this. This is a typical uh, picture of a viral infection, okay? But this is also seen in chronic bacterial infection as well. And some of the exceptional cases are here, like whooping cough. Whooping cough is not considered chronic bacterial infection, but here occurs lymphocytosis, 
is a, don't forget this is a very important question in many exam brucellosis is another one okay these two are bacterial infection hepatitis and infectious mononucleosis are viral infection tuberculosis is a chronic bacterial infection so it is very easy for us to understand it is also seen in cll because we are talking about lymphocytosis so in cll mature lymphocytes would be present in the circulation now, what about monocytosis now? now we all know what is monocyte they are the circulating form of macrophages so and they are called chronic inflammatory cells so any chronic infection in the body monocytosis can be there like tuberculosis okay rickets uh, rickettsiosis means chronic rickettsial diseases and even in malaria and multiple connective tissue disorder and even inflammatory bowel disease would have monocytosis and the last one is the easiest of them all if neutrophilic leukocytosis or neutrophilia is there you think about acute bacterial infection and the reason is large number of neutrophils are released from the bone marrow with the effect of interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor okay so though we we know most of the things before but it is good to revise these things time and again fine let's go to number five now these type of uh, mcqs are difficult if you know the exact percentage okay you can answer otherwise uh, you know there's a high chance of picking the wrong option Anyone want to have a try here? Sir, option E. Option E? You mm. mean 90%? No, sir. Yes, sir. Option D. Option D, 50%? Sir. Yes, sir. 40 to 50%, sir. Okay. I want to hear it's some. 40 to 50%. I want sir. some other student to take option A, B, and C also. Come on, guys. Mm. C. No, sir. It's option D. Option okay. C. Now, Ijaz is telling option C, Naimut is going for option D, and Ilyas is going for option E. Now, I already told you this is a, a bit difficult type of uh, okay, question. Now, the correct answer here is option C, that is 20%. Now, how, how you remember, okay? I will tell you a statement here. Okay. Almost one fifth of down syndrome babies develop cardiovascular anomaly this is easier one one fifth means 20 percent now let me talk a little bit about it, about this now see here the correct answer is c that is 20 percent this fact is worth remembering one fifth of down syndrome patient have congenital cardiovascular disease and you know which is the most common one isn't it what is the name of that commonest cardiovascular condition in down syndrome ostium primum defect what is the another name of this ostium primum defect there is another name which is even more commonly used than this anyone because in other exam in in other exam you know that name may be given to you and if you don't know you will you will spoil that question yes endocardial cushion defect endocardial cushion defect is the same term as ostium primum defect so don't get confused okay both both are synonym after that vsd is also commonly seen now in down syndrome there's a lot of other things are going on but uh, from the examination point of view we love to ask two more thing here one is all the incidence of ALL is very high in Down syndrome. And another one, uh, when there is at the age of 40, okay, or fourth decade of life, we say, they suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And this Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. Now, 
other people they develop alzheimer quite late in their life after 80 or maybe even in 90 years but in this condition alzheimer disease is uh, developed quite early so this is the uh, some of the important information so let's go to number six So I will go with the option A. You want to go with option A? Can you give me the yes, explanation? Yes, sir. Because first of all, this uh, the patient has this eight years old patient, and uh -huh. secondly, we have the problem in the bone, in the backbone, and it represents maybe like arthritis. Mm -hmm. uh, so in osteoarthritis, it is like a safe option is biopsy to do biopsy and reveal the examination or diagnosis. So, okay, okay. Let me hear yes. some more answers. Okay, any anybody else? Yes, sir. Anybody else? No. Option B. Option D. Why? Give me reason, please. Uh, option uh, B. Yeah. Why option D? Uh, I would do a digital rectal exam just to try and feel for the consistency of the prostate. So because in malignancy, mostly it's uh, kind of rough, uh -huh. and if it's normal, it's uh, smooth. Okay, so you want to give yes. you want to go for digital rectal exam? Yes. Okay. Any other any other student? Sir, option D. Option D, you want to go for radio yes, nuclide sir. bone scan? Why? Yes. Why? Because uh, we have uh, we are going to, to do radio nuclide bone scan uh, to rule out the metastatic cancer of the bone. Okay, metastatic cancer of the bone. Okay. Now, okay. Now see here. The options which you have chosen must have been done with a diagnosis in your mind, isn't it? So what diagnosis is there in your mind? Yes, which, which disease we are talking here? Which, if, if, you, are, if you want to do uh, all these biopsy, a digital rectal exam or radionuclide bone scan, right? You are thinking of probably a cancer or malignancy. Which cancer we are talking here? Um, adenocarcinoma. Prostate. Exactly, adenocarcinoma of the prostate, or you can call it prostatic cancer, right? Now, now what have they asked? Okay, let me go through this case one once again. This is an eight-year-old man who has a low back pain. An X-ray of the lower back and pelvis shows sclerotic change in the lower vertebra and in focal areas throughout the pelvis. Now, one one point I like to highlight here. At this age. Osteoarthritis is a very common disorder, okay? So probably it is already there in the patient. But let, let us move to 
other part of the history. The radiologist report states that sclerotic changes may be represent osteoarthritis. So radiologists have already uh, diagnosed it. But metastatic prostate cancer cannot be excluded because it may also present in the same way. Uh, who knows? This back pain may be caused by a metastasis to the vertebra from the prostate. And look at the age. This person is very old. So to rule out this adenocarcinoma of the prostate, which of the following is most cost effective in the initial workup of this patient? Now you need to choose all your options are correct. Let me remind you once again, okay? But the question is about cost effective initial workup. So the most appropriate answer here is digital rectal exam. It doesn't cost anything, isn't it? Just put a finger in the in the anal canal, you know, it doesn't cost anything. Other investigations are costly, okay? But all those uh, tests must be done once you suspect uh, adenocarcinoma of the prostate. Even prostate-specific antigen should be done. Even serum alkaline phosphatase should be done because the metastasis from carcinoma of prostate is osteoblastic type of metastasis. So osteoblast will come into the picture and alkaline phosphatase comes from osteoblast. They don't come from osteoclast. So even alkaline phosphatase will be high here. Prostate specific antigen is elevated in carcinoma of the prostate, but it is also elevated in benign prostatic hyperplasia. So probably uh, the best cost effective uh, initial workup is digital rectum, rectal exam and you feel very hard prostate gland, very hard. So we can uh, suspect this is a malignancy and we can do some other tests to confirm it. You can go, go through this a bit later, okay? Now let's go to the number seven. Okay, so who can uh, uh, answer this? The option A. Option A, option that A. is bilirubin. So yes, explain sir. explain why you, you chose option A. So usually we have two types of gallstone. One is pigmented gallstone and another is non-pigmented gallstone. If mm -hmm. the bilirubin level is high in the urine, so it will suggest some type of hemolytic anemia, mm -hmm. and that these uh, bilirubin can cause the gallstone also. Okay, okay, okay. I'll come, come, come to your explanation a bit later. Okay. Any other student? Yes. A. Why A? A is correct option. There's no doubt. A is correct one. Okay, but explanation should be given that what i want yes anybody else
Now I'll ask you some question here, okay? And you yourself will reach to the correct uh, explanation. Now, which type of bilirubin comes out in the urine? Which type? Which type of bilirubin? Mm -hmm. There are two types of bilirubin, isn't it? Unconjugated mm -hmm. and conjugated. So which, which type comes out in the urine? Which is water-soluble bilirubin? Conjugated. Conjugated. Okay, conjugated, not unconjugated. Okay, unconjugated is fat soluble. Conjugated is water soluble. So, conjugated is excreted in the urine. Now, the answer he chose is a correct one, but explanation needs to be a little bit modified here. Now, see here, probably in the gallbladder, the gallstone is formed. Okay, somehow the gallstone is formed. There are so many reasons for the gallstone formation. Now, one of the gallstone may slip out of the gallbladder and reach the common bile duct. That can cause obstructive jaundice. That obstructive jaundice will lead to conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and that bilirubin may appear in the urine. That's, uh, that's what you can see. Okay. So, whenever they talk about bilirubin in the urine, it's always conjugated one. So, remember this. Now, if glucose is seen in the urine, which case you suspect? Glucose in the urine, which case? Diabetes. Exactly, diabetes. What is the what is another case where you you see glucose, but it's, it is not a diabetes? What is that condition? That is not a case of diabetes, but you can still see uh, glucose. There have been the threshold of the kidney is lower than normal. Very good, very good. Okay, I want to hear exactly that answer. When renal threshold, renal threshold to glucose is less, then also glucose appears in the urine. Now, nitrite, if nitrite is positive in the urine, what does that mean? Nitrite. UTI. UTI, excellent. Urinary tract infection, okay? Don't forget this. This is called nitrite reduction test, which is positive in UTI. Now, protein. Protein in urine is a very easy answer. Anybody can answer that. Okay. I even don't want to ask that question. And urobilinogen. Now, urobilinogen in the urine. Which, which case? Normally present. Okay. It is normally present. Absolutely. Okay. It is normally present in the urine. So uh, measurement of urobilinogen in urine probably doesn't tell us anything. So the answer is A or bilirubin. Now, number eight. Please mute yourself, okay? When you want to answer, then only unmute. Otherwise, it will disturb everyone. Now, this is uh, one of the easiest case, okay? So you can diagnose quickly.
Okay, you can uh, answer this. Anyone? Option B, sir. Option B, uh, that is gynecomastia. Why you chose that option? You are right, actually. That is the correct answer. So I'll go with the option A. You want to go for option A, okay? Why option A? You have to give reason, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because uh, there is, uh, it is painless, and as the, the firm must beneath the nipple is uh, in his left breast. And secondly, it is immobile, and there is no fluid. And according to option B, gynecomastia, gynecomastia occur in both sides of the uh, breast. Mm -hmm. So I think it is fibrocystic changes okay. because there is no pain and it's movable. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. So who wants to give reason for gynecomastia B? Yes. Who answered that? Uh, yes, uh, because um, when you look at option A, fibrocystic changes, it occurs mostly in female. Okay. Because of the hormonal imbalances. Uh huh. And then option C, uh, intraductal papilloma. Yeah, usually there should be a discharge because it's inside the duct. It should there should be a discharge. Very good. Then for option D and E, these are invasive carcinomas, and the age is seventeen, so that's rare very nice okay he has he has explained it in a wonderful way excellent now see that okay uh let me let me repeat this again the age of this patient is 17 year old male okay the sex is important here this is uh, not a female and develops a painless form mass beneath the nipple of his left breast this is unilateral the right breast is normal this is a very typical presentation of gynecomastia. Remember, gynecomastia is not usually unilateral is more common than bilateral. Okay, bilateral can also occur, but if a male is having this type of enlargement on one side of the breast, it is always gynecomastia. In female, we even don't use that term. Now, fibrocystic changes usually occur just before the menstruation in those ladies who are probably 30s and 40s years of age and these are hormonal changes okay inside the breast and there is a combination of fibrosis and cystic changes inside the breast so this is a benign type of uh, condition so only uh, if i consider the sex i can exclude fibrocystic change Intraductal papilloma is absolutely correct. There should be discharge. There is no history of any discharge here. And D and E are invasive cancer. There is no clue given for the invasive cancers. Okay, so answer is B. This is how you come to the conclusion. Now, question number nine. This is option E. Okay, this is option E, that is hepatic cirrhosis. Why? Because uh, uh, he has multiple spider angiomas, yellow stain, gynecomastia, and many things which are uh, present in liver cirrhosis. Uh, very good it, yeah it very is, good it can be yeah bronchogenic carcinoma because the uh, bronchogenic carcinoma are present mostly in older age 
good and very good he is only put to cardio yes yes so i will go for hepatic cirrhosis because yes so absolutely correct you know most of the explanation he he has given is very very correct now see there physical examination of a 45 year old man just 45 year who looks much older than his stated age this is one of the appearance in cirrhosis of the liver the person looks older than their age thin arms and leg this is because of malnutrition or swollen abdomen it is because of ascites red tongue okay red tongue probably uh, it is because of some inflammation because this person is immunocompromised uh, uh, and any type of infection can occur there or i can also uh, say maybe because of some vitamin deficiency especially vitamin b dry thin and slightly yellow skin this may be because of jaundice gynecomastia typical feature of cirrhosis testicular atrophy another typical feature multiple spider angioma very very important point tremor this is called flapping tremor okay yellow discoloration of the sclera okay. this is jaundice and short term memory loss this is a important feature of hepatic encephalopathy so all features are pointing towards hepatic cirrhosis i cannot even think of any other diagnosis here this is a very easy case okay now number 10 it is b okay it is b that is hydrocephalus uh, how can you explain that because sir uh, in hydrocephalus there is uh, multiple episodes of vomiting and also headache because of intracranial pressure mm -hmm. and the other things yeah are also present in hydrocephalus so i will go for hydrocephalus Okay. These two things, vomiting and headaches, are clue towards hydrocephalus. Yeah. Okay. So okay. any any okay you yeah, okay I'll come back to you. Any other student? Any anyone else? You think of any other it's diagnosis? It's hydrocephalus. It's hydrocephalus. Uh, sir, it's hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. Okay. So many of you are are uh, choosing hydrocephalus, and Izaz has given some good explanation. Okay. This is hydrocephalus. and another way uh, another way to say hydrocephalus is ruling other options one by one okay if you are confused this is a easy one actually if if you are confused then rule out other one by one cleft palate where is the where is the you know clue for cleft palate here isn't it nothing anencephaly where is the clue for that brain is absent in anencephaly they have not given anything like that syringomyelia is not a disease of a brain it is a disease of spinal cord and congenital aneurysm okay which aneurysm they have not mentioned so uh, in hydrocephalus most of this feature will occur so this is hydrocephalus good now number 11 
this is a very straightforward question diagnosis is already given and they are asking uh, where is the likely e. defect so option e option e that is phenyl yes, alanine sir. hydroxylase hydroxylase okay. yes sir okay any other any other student option e option e okay phenyl alanine hydroxylase okay that is the correct answer okay this is the enzyme this is the enzyme which convert phenyl alanine into tyrosine amino acid okay yes phenyl alanine into tyrosine if this enzyme is absent or not working properly phenyl alanine cannot be converted into tyrosine so it will remain as phenyl alanine and then it will undergo into abnormal metabolic pathway and this disorder is known as phenyl ketonuria i like to so a little bit information for you regarding this please go through this here okay let me help you see here the answer is e this phenyl ketonuria results in severe mental retardation and is caused by a defect in the gene that provides the code for phenyl alanine hydroxylase remember the name of this enzyme this enzyme converts phenyl alanine to tyrosine now as a result of this defective gene there is abundance amount of phenyl alanine in the brain now this phenyl alanine will convert into toxic metabolite and the name of those toxic metabolite are phenyl alanine okay like for example phenyl ketonuria okay? it will develop into ketone bodies okay phenyl acetic acid it may convert into acetic acid so all of these are quite damaging to the developing brain so a very important type of case especially from microbiology sorry from biochemical point of view okay this is a biochemistry chemistry question now number 12 i think i'll make this as a last case for today okay just go through it please it's option c it's option c do you mean myasthenia gravis can you give explanation uh yes sir because uh, the the person has weakness weakness okay but there is no clinical signs of denervation mm -hmm. so and and one other thing it is uh, yeah uh, it is recovered with administration of uh, uh the drugs which inhibit uh, acetyl uh, choline choline esterase so it means that uh, the uh, uh, the drug is uh, acetyl choline uh, to mm -hmm. increase acetyl choline yeah okay Immediate. okay 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 very good good explanation you have given okay but still uh, any other student uh, want to say something here please this is the last case for today sir myasthenia gravis is autoimmune disorder in which uh, there is antibody against the acetylcholine receptor while the acetylcholine is an enzyme which used for the breakdown of acetylcholine 
if we give the drugs which inhibit the acetylcholine esterase, it will elevate the acetylcholine level. Like uh, it, uh, it, uh, the antibodies are usually competitive type to the receptor. If we increase the uh, level of acetylcholine, it mm -hmm. will remove the auto antibody from the receptor. It will act on acetylcholine receptor, so the all this condition will be reversed. Okay, so both of you uh, uh, are saying this is a case of myasthenia gravis. Okay, and that is a good explanation you have given. But I want to hear the name of those drug. Can you tell me the name of drug uh, which uh, we want to use here? Which so drug? New stigmine. Okay. Hydrophonium. Very good. Hydrophonium. Yes. New stigmine. Very good. Okay. Now, okay. Now, actually, hydrophonium is the drug which we use to know whether this is a real case of myasthenia gravis or not. But for the treatment purpose, you want to use neostigmine and pyridostigmine. Okay, exactly, absolutely correct. The way uh, you know, uh, Isaz and Ilyas uh, described this case, there is a uh, absolutely okay. Now, see here, I like to show a little bit thing uh, for the rest of the students, and we want to conclude today's class. This myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease, okay, it is an autoimmune disease, we all know that. See here, okay that cause cranial nerve and limb muscle weakness by producing antibody that act against nicotinic receptor at the neuromuscular junction. And these uh, antibodies are called, okay, which what is the name of that antibody? Okay, what is the name of that antibody? Anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't have any special name. Anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. Now, the result is that the action of nerve fiber that innervate the skeletal muscles are affected. Okay, producing, producing the loss of effect of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Is absolutely right. These are competitive type of antibody. They they fight with acetylcholine to bind to those receptor so our whole purpose is if we increase the concentration of acetylcholine there then those antibody cannot bind to the acetylcholine receptor and the person will feel all right so we want to inhibit that enzyme which degrade acetylcholine and the name of that enzyme is acetylcholine esterase that's why if we give certain drug which bind with that enzyme then the patient will feel better. And the perfect drug here is okay, hydrophonium during the diagnostic purpose. But after you diagnose the disease, pyridostigmine is very commonly used these days along with neostigmine. Okay, so with this, let me stop here now.